Hello, everyone. Semi-retired Bob here. We have a very special guest with us today. Coach Stephen is talking to us from across the pond in the UK. Say hello, Stephen. Hello, Bob. Nice to see you. And uh, it's such a pleasure and an honor to be invited on because I've seen some of your material and it's very good. Particularly enjoyed an interview you did with Bart Kay. So uh, we may circle back to some of the content in there, I think. Yes, indeed, we probably will. So to just get us started, you have coach in your title. So why don't you go ahead and give us however long it takes. Tell us who you are, why you have coach in your title, and how you came to be a carnivore. Ah, well, that's really good. Uh, if you've got about 30 minutes, and I'll, t I'll tell you the answer. Um, it's my 60th birthday next month, and about five years ago, I started carnivore. So I'm going to go backwards rather than do a linear sort of chronological thing. And the coach bit came from that five years ago when I decided to do online coaching in a really big way. I'd signed up with Meet RX and did the training with Sean Baker and all that sort of stuff. But um, that's just the tip of the iceberg, really, because before that I was keto for a couple of years and I turned low carb when I was 50. I do have quite a few qualifications, so if I just reel them off and, and get that out of the way, I have an honours degree in physiology and health sciences, so I've always been interested in health and everything around health. I'm also a specialist practitioner in obesity and diabetes, so we have general practitioners which do everything with general, and I specialise in obesity and diabetes, which I've been doing for a long time before I was low carb, uh, and so obviously that's quite a big journey, and also I'm a qualified phlebotomist, and the coach bit is uh, in my 40s, I became an advanced personal trainer and I was very lucky to be able to train someone that ended up at the Olympics. And I took a very overweight person who was a uh, chain smoker, four stones overweight, so that's about um, 48 pounds, something like that anyway, uh, and uh, ended up being in the top 20% of the world in marathon running. So the coaching comes from that. I'm also interested in rehab for joints and um muscular pains and stuff like that there's, there's a few other little qualifications i won't bore people with that because they're more interested in the nutrition side of things i think and the health side of things so that's what i tend to focus on i didn't really call myself coach Stephen when i first did this but um at meet or x everyone was called coach you know x coach bob coach dave coach emily so i decided to just join the gang and call myself coach Stephen. uh right the carnivore journey which uh, was the other part of the question, was really interesting because before age 50, I absolutely fell hook, line and sinker for the food guidelines. I really did follow everything to the T. I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. I had skimmed milk. I had porridge oats in the morning or oatmeal, as you call it in America. I had lots of fresh veg and fresh fruit to the point where I was growing the veg in my garden. And um, that really became quite extensive. And for those vegans out there, boy, did I kill a lot of animals to stop my veg being eaten. Uh, and I look back at that and can't believe I didn't spot that I was doing that. It really did look like Fort Knox. And uh, I was buying lots of pesticides and laying traps and all these sort of things. Not once, not once did I think, wow, the poor animals. All I wanted to do was grow my potatoes and grow my carrots and all of that sort of stuff. I even tried to grow raspberries, which was really difficult because green fly and white fly and every sort of um, thing that could possibly eat raspberries would do that. So that really was something that I tried different sprays on and all those sort of things. And that was it. That was in my 40s. And as I say, I was a personal trainer, an advanced personal trainer to boot. And I was getting fatter and I was getting sicker. And all my life I had followed this, the food guidelines. My parents died when I was really young and my mother died of colon cancer. And for the vegans that seem to think that uh, you only get colon cancer from eating red meat, I can tell you that's absolute baloney. Absolute 100% because my mother was very strict and adhered to the no red meat, no saturated fat, eat lots of bran, lots of fiber. She had bran flakes every morning. So she was always eating um, roughage and uh, she didn't smoke. She didn't drink. She was very active, would walk a lot every single day, was always out and about sitting in the garden, following the food guidelines. And there she was with a nine, nine pound colon cancer growth. 
okay, didn't eat red meat, didn't eat saturated fat, didn't eat butter. She was doing all the margarine. She was doing everything she should, low fat, thyroid problems, the whole gambit. And that was um, started in my teenage years. I lost my dad as well, which was uh, another thing. I lost a girlfriend to breast cancer. She'd actually looked after my mother in intensive care. And that's how I met her. She died of breast cancer. She also followed the um, food guidelines. So everybody around me was adhering to this ridiculous way of eating, I now realize. But we all thought it was great. And then um, I think the first inkling that I'd been duped was actually when I was still believing in high carb, but I did my um, diabetes qualifications and started to hear people saying, well, why don't you look at the amount of carbohydrates someone is eating and then just make sure that medication covers these carbohydrates. And because I'd come from outside of the medical profession, I was one of those that put my hand up and said, well, why not just reduce the carbohydrates? It seems sensible if you want to get rid of the medications or reduce the medications. And of course, that was laughed out of the lecture room, even though it is absolute common sense that if you have to raise medication because you're eating more carbohydrates and you're trying to get people off medications, the first thing you would do is reduce the carbohydrates. But anyway, that's by the by. That really was the first sort of penny dropping moment, so to speak. And then I got lower left quadrant pain. I also had a coronary artery calcium scan because I've always been interested in health. And it was 639 and absolutely awful. And I spoke to the consultant who actually knew a guy called Ivor Cummins, which was really interesting at that time. And uh, we got talking about the fact that um, my wife was just about to have a test and she'd spent all of her life eating butter and bacon and eggs and avoiding bread and avoiding things like that. And her score was zero. So there was I, the poster boy for the food guidelines, and I was a state. Then I got lower left quadrant pain, uh, which is what really common if you're eating veg, ever such a lot of veg. And it's all fresh, like I say, nothing to do with what I was growing. It was all really good veg. And um, I had to have a colonoscopy. And I can remember I was 49. And I believed all the rubbish about um, genetics. So I thought my mum's died of colon cancer. Here am I, I'm going to die before I'm 50 of colon cancer. I now realize all of all of what I thought then was a load of rubbish. And this is something I always remember when I have nasty comments on my YouTube channel, because the people that are leaving those nasty comments and think that this is the terrible way to eat have no clue. And I didn't have a clue. And I wouldn't have believed me if I could go back in time 15 years and listen to my videos now, I would find it hard to believe that we've been duped on such a massive scale. It's it is literally unbelievable. So I was getting fatter. I had athlete's foot for 35 years, lower left quadrant pain for many, many years. I had a coronary artery calcium scan. I was absolutely petrified I was going to die of either colon cancer or of a heart attack. And at age 50, I just realized that I'd run out of options. I couldn't take anything else out of my diet because, like I say, wasn't smoking, wasn't drinking, wasn't having saturated fat, wasn't having red meat, never even heard of what a rib eye was. And then I discovered on the internet Dear old Dr. Eric Berg and the low-carb way of eating. This was also in tandem with people coming into the clinic, and the diabetic clinic, and the only ones that were successful were the ones that were going low-carb. And they were telling me what they were doing. And I was really interested. So it just all sort of mel melted together, and it was just obvious that I'd missed this really big call in to, to um, wake up to low-carb, especially as... Like I say, I was seeing people on a daily basis who looked great. 90% uh, of the people followed the uh, guidelines that the doctor and the uh, nurse practitioner was giving them. They, they weren't getting anywhere. And as we know now, or I know now, diabetic medications don't stop diabetic complications. They don't get you anywhere, really. Um, you can sort of try to out-train it for a bit, but it will catch up with you. So anyway, I went low carb, and that was it. The scales fell off my eyes. And I realized I'd been duped and it was it was great. And I used to have a big rash here. It looked like somebody had got a strawberry and smashed it against my face. Uh, that went, the athlete's foot went, which for years I tried everything to get rid of. It just went. I didn't need to, to use powder or a really, really dry between my toes or a hair dryer or all that. 
it just went because I was eating properly. My lower left quadrant pain is a long distant memory. It really is a long distant memory. I lost a lot of weight, which was great. I could get into my um, tennis kit. I'd won a singles title when I was in my 20s from tennis, and I could get back into that. And clothes that I hadn't worn for years, I could get into. I was just much fitter. Uh, my hearing, by the way, Bob, I, I don't know if you know this about me. I wear hearing aids. I lip read. I have to have special equipment here. Even my hearing started to improve, which it hadn't done for 35 years and the audiologist would not believe that it was the way I was eating that was making a big difference so all in all it was doing great but um not 100 percent and the more I looked at people like Dr Kenberry and um like I say Eric Berg and there was a few other people who have since gone off the boil and a bit rubbish now um I realized that maybe I should cut the carbohydrates even more went keto and when Diet Doctor was a really good website, which it isn't anymore, sadly, um, they had some really good advice and some good people on there. So I started going more ketogenic. And then being an intelligent person, I realized, you know what, if I cut even more carbs out, how's that going to be? Is that going to be really good? So I started listening to Dr. Sean Baker, Paul Saladino before he lost the plot. And it was it was great so I went carnivore at age 55 and here I am nearly five years later just coming up to age 60 and it was the best thing I ever did and I am so pleased to report that I have had over a thousand clients in that time and just in even today you know somebody reversed a non-alcoholic fatty liver I've had somebody curing their type 2 diabetes and I'm, I'm going to stop saying reversing type 2 diabetes they've cured it yes if they go back to eating the rubbish then it's going to come back. But if you eat the proper species appropriate diet, or as uh, what, what does Ken Berry call it, the PhD, the proper human diet, then it, you won't get the diabetic complications. You won't have problems managing your blood glucose. So for me, if you look up the definition of cured, that's getting rid of your health symptoms, and they go. This guy is absolutely super fit, but I get that time and time again, and it's amazing. And I just love this way of life. It's so simple. You save money on things like utensils in the kitchen. You don't have to have a, a myriad of cookbooks. Uh, you can just have ribeye and eggs and you can have bacon and butter and all these tasty foods and loads of fish, salmon and mackerel and scallops. And it's just awesome. And you get loads of energy. And um, that's about it in a nutshell. So thank you for that. Um, so you have a birthday in May. Yep. As mine is also in May. I'm May the 10th. And, you know, I did know that you were 59 getting ready to turn 60. But when I first saw you, I said, well, here's another young chap in his 40s. So <laughs> I, I, turned six, I turned 61 on May the 10th. Cool. OK. I'm May the 25th. OK. So okay. I'll always be a year older than you. You will always be. I'll try and catch you up. <laughs> because you are a personal trainer, fitness coach, mm -hmm. obesity coach, all that, my audience is significantly elder. I have mm -hmm. a lot of 60 to 75-year-olds who are just getting started in trying to get more fit. If mm -hmm. you could give them some advice and perhaps suggest an exercise or two for people in my age group and older, what would that be? Ah, that's a great question. Um, before people switch off and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm 70, I'm, if this is not going to be pertinent. My oldest client turned 92 this year, and I met them at age 89. They could, they could barely walk. I mean, this is a true story. I just, so I just want people to know that they can make a really big difference. Um, yeah, so I won't give you his name because he's quite a shy person. But anyway, came to me at 89. His son actually had to hold his arm so he could walk to come and see me. Um, this was obviously not an online consultation, but somebody local. And uh, they were in quite a lot of pain and hardly move. So anyway. I, I won't tell the exercises straight away. I'll tell you what happened because about maybe six weeks after seeing him, I was walking in the park with my wife, Jane, and uh, pops around the corner is this chap. 
And I said, oh, to James, I said, oh, well, that's that Doug I saw. Let's go and say hello. Now, out of context, because we, you know, I was in my casual gear, not in my rehab gear. He didn't recognize me straight away. I went, Doug, you saw me six weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yes, Stephen, of course. I said, well, what have you done? He said, well, actually, it was my 90th birthday yesterday, and I played nine holes of golf. Wow. <laughs> From literally unable to do 50 steps. So nobody out there listening in your uh in your remit can excuse themselves on being too old or too unfit you but you've got to start somewhere so when people talk about intense exercise and you look online and you think well that's a bit intense you know this lifting up tires or throwing fridges over hedges or whatever that's not what we're talking about so if, if you can't get out of a chair then that is intense and that is your intense exercise so if it if you really struggle you have to put your arms up to get yourself out of a chair then you can do that more often and just set yourself a little target so if let's say um you can only do that three times a day you just set a target i'm going to do it four times a day and then the day after i'm going to do it five times a day and you just build up and you train those muscles to do that and just make sure everything's safe all right so one of the things i definitely am big on is is people not pushing themselves and injuring themselves. So you've just got to be sensible and you've got to be patient. It's um, not going to happen overnight, but you will start feeling a lot of benefits from movement. So one of my clients said, motion is lotion. You know, all their joint pains were going because they started to move again and stopped being scared of moving. Um, I might send you a picture of somebody I had in a Zimmer frame, completely bent over, all of um, the mainstream medical people have given up on her. And within about uh, five months, not only was she completely straight, but didn't really need the Zimmer frame. So you can get remarkable results from really simple exercises. So in saying that, I do have exercises online. I do have programs that are online and they build up from really super easy to, you know, uh, progress. And so there's progress progression already built in and you can set your own goals now i like to do things to a time rather than reps or sets so a rep is you know how many times a repetition so if you're doing a bicep curl you know that's one rep to you know th therefore uh then you have a little break after say 10 reps and then you do it again well i'm not into that i'm into sort of little 60 second bursts of of something now if i pick this pen up and I did a bicep curl with that pen, uh, I could do that all day. You have to find a weight that is a little bit difficult. So when they say resistance training, the thing you're holding is resisting you moving it. And we're always working against gravity, basically. Sorry to be really patronizing, but I like people to understand what we're doing here. So that pen, you know, you're stopping falling to gravity. So you pick up a dumbbell. Oh, that's really difficult. So if you're going to work your arms, you just got to look at your body and think, well, what am I working? So you can see that that muscle has to contract to bring this part of your arm up. Right. So I'm not speaking to people out there who are bodybuilding and stuff. Like I've done a bodybuilding tournament. I know what I'm talking about. But I'm trying to be as basic as possible. All right. So you can work out and try and save people money as well. All right. That's how I work my bicep, isn't it? Now, in a 60 second period of time, you should get to the point where the weight is so heavy relative to your, your ability, that you can barely move your arm. So you do what's called a partial rep. And li literally, if you can't do another slight movement, you've worked to failure. And that isn't the thing that does the magic. It's your body doing a training response because it learns, wow, if, if Bob's going to keep doing this thing with his arm, I better make the muscles better. I better make those joints better. I've got to make this person stronger because if they do that again tomorrow, I want to be prepared. Very layman's, but that's what we're doing. And you can do some simple exercises. Again, lifting something over your head. Could be water bottles. Could be, um, you know, those uh, bags of rice that you never use anymore. 
that are still sticking at the back of the cupboard. Well, they, you could have a use for them. You could lift them above your head and work your shoulders. You could hold them behind you and, and uh, work your tricep. You see, you know, because that, that's now extended and then it contracts, it contracts, it moves it there. So you can do biceps, triceps, shoulders like that. You could lay on the floor and get something heavy and push it away from you. Is what your, your chest, you can, should be able to feel that your chest muscle is bringing your arm across you like that. So that's your chest. You could just hold water bottles maybe on your shoulders and you could just squat down. Or if you've got a seat behind you, just get your bottom to touch the seat and then stand back up again. So exercise is not rocket science. It is just all about movement. Nothing... Um, is wrong with walking, for instance, but I call that incidental exercise because it's not really going to push you to a physiological limit. You're not going to get in and think, oh, wow, you know, I, I hope my body does a training response so I can walk faster, and much, much further. That's really gradual. But you do these sort of prescribed exercises and before you know it, you will see differences. I mean, one of my favorite things for people that have never exercised is things like um, leg lifts where you just hold onto something so you're nice and steady and then you kick your leg forward and back. So your leg's going forward and back, forward and back. It's difficult to show you because, you know, I've only got like a portrait thing here. But anything that gets you moving, if there's a bit of resistance, that really helps. So with that leg swing thing, you can get uh, weights that you just attach to your legs Resistance bands are really good. Um, you know, I, I, I've got what's called the X3, which is a bit uh, sort of advanced. But, you know, things like this, let's get one. You know, you can just get a resistance band. There's things you can do with resistance bands, you know, like the old-fashioned chest expanders. You know, you can do that and you can move around with your uh, resistance bands as well. So you can do it pretty cheaply. Um, you don't have to buy tons and tons of equipment. If you're... Wanting to run, you see, this is different now. If your goal is to run, the best way to train for running is to run. Simple as that. But that's uh, that's for another another day. I think most people of this age, you want to first start trying to improve your bone density and your muscle mass, and that's done with resistance training. But if you're 70 and you think, well, I want to run a 5K, um, that's your goal. That's really what you want to do then it is just best to uh, start running, even if you're over in the park on a, on a softer surface like the grass, and just, just run to see what you can do. And um, the next day, try and do a little bit more, a little bit quicker, a little bit further, and just build up your fitness that way. Now, within your coaching community, do you primarily just do exercise and physiology or do you actually get into diet stuff with them as well well actually yeah i i would say the majority of what i do is about nutrition because the cornerstone of all health really is what you're eating um, i'm a great believer in you know all the memes abs are built in the kitchen you can't outrun our bad diet it's no good doing all the exercise and then eating tons of carbs and loads of potatoes and pasta and rice and drinking Coke and all that. So you, your health is not going to, you might look a bit better, but your health is not going to really improve. It is down to what you eat. For instance, um, the last interview I did, the, the person had lost 77 pounds, didn't exercise at all. I'm not saying that exercise is bad, but I'm just, he's a very good example of someone who went from eating the standard American diet to eating uh, keto and then carnivore, and he just saw the weight drop off. All these other markers were great. Triglycerides, were, you know, were really low. Uh, he'd lost his fatty liver disease and all this sort of stuff. So um, I, I tend to do mostly nutrition. I do have meal plans. I know carnivore is so simple, you tend not to need them, but people like them. They just can't leave macros alone and tracking. I mean, I believe that tracking is looking in the mirror, looking at your clothes, thinking, oh, this is, this is a bit looser than it used to be. Oh, my pants fit better. Or I can get into the jeans I couldn't get into uh, 10 years ago. That's great tracking. But still, people want meal plans, so I offer a meal plan. Um, it's... It has all your macros for you if you're interested in that sort of thing. But once once you've done this for a couple of months or three months and you've seen the results, you tend to get a bit more intuitive. This is why I'm not a millionaire because I don't pe ask people to keep paying 
that I want people to be intuitive. I want people to just eyeball uh, uh, steak and eggs or whatever they have in or a nice piece of salmon and think, yeah, that's going to be enough to fill me up. Um, so yeah, it is it is mostly nutrition, to be honest, but there's a lot of health in there. The qualified phlebotomist part of me, I do get people sending me their bloods. I have written a book, uh, The Guide to Blood Testing, in the context of keto, low-carb and carnivore, because a lot of the readings are misinterpreted because it's based on normal ranges from people that eat 60% carbs. And, and we're really different. We eat more protein, we eat more fats, we eat less carbs. So our ranges are different. So uh, I can send you a link to all the books. I've written five different books, one about diabetes, one about how to be carnivore, one about the science behind losing weight this way, the insulin model, and um, how to gain muscle without carbs. So there's lots of things. I tick a lot of boxes because I do a lot of things, and I've been doing it for a long time and had a lot of success. So um, that's possibly the main thing, actually, more nutrition than anything else. You did mention something in there that I need to wanted to touch on very briefly with you. You uh, said that, you know, check the triglycerides. And of course, that brings us to the whole cholesterol discussion. I personally believe that our body sets our cholesterol levels, provided we're eating a proper human diet that our body sets our cholesterol levels and they are what they are. But what are your thoughts on this? Is it really dangerous to have the high LDL, which is not actually cholesterol? It's low density proteins, <laughs> which you very well know, but is it dangerous? Well, no, it's based, it's based on a uh, fraud, uh, saturated fat, and then cholesterol is implicated in heart disease when it should have been sugar. And that's all well documented. Two Harvard researchers were paid by the Sugar Research Foundation. And uh, since then, everything that's followed is, is nonsense. Simple, it is as simple as that. You've got to look at all other markers. If all other markers are going down, up, in a, in a way that is better for you, so you lose body fat, your blood pressure goes down, your body composition has improved, your sleep's improved, your uh, blood show that you have low triglycerides, high HDL, for instance. Your type 2 diabetes is completely reversed. You don't need any medications. And your LDL goes up. Why would it go up in a healthy person? Well, it goes up because your gene expression requires you to have that higher level of low-density lipoprotein, which is a carrier particle that takes stuff around your body and offloads the cargo. And there is no... There is no study that shows a cause and effect that LDL is causing atherosclerosis. That that just doesn't happen. And one of the things I've seen um, Dr. Allo or someone saying it definitely is causal because you can you can um, get an artery and you can break it down and uh, then you can introduce LDL and you'll get an atherosclerotic plaque. That proves it. And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, why do you have to damage the artery then? Why can't you do it without damaging the artery in the first place? Because if, after 70 years, that's what they should be able to do. They should be able to put an artery in isolation, introduce some LDL, and prove that the, once the cholesterol comes out, it causes a plaque. And they, they've not been able to do that. So that does not seem to be convincing. The contents of the plaque doesn't have... LDL uh, particles doesn't have cholesterol in it as uh, we're led to believe that isn't really the case there's more um, different materials that are involved in clotting um, are, are in the plaque there and also when you do get cholesterol it's cholesterol crystals which don't come from LDL uh, actually comes from your bloodstream so there are many things wrong with the uh, theory to be honest if you've got a theory and you did that 70 years ago. And firstly, the theory was based on fraud, which is documented. I'm not saying anything controversial. Um, and you can't prove it after 70 years. Then something's wrong there. And it's not. It, it, you can't prove it's causal. It's just, it's just not there. The other thing is when you look at all cause mortality, and that's a big buzzword that we need to keep ramming down people's throats. All cause mortality means Will you die of anything? Well, when you look at that, uh, all cause mortality, the lower your cholesterol or LDL cholesterol, I should say, the lower it is, the more likely you are to die younger. Or you can conversely look at it as the higher your LDL cholesterol, 
the longer you're going to live when it's down to all cause mortality. You just have to look at the studies, who's funding them, look at the sense behind it. Your body is not stupid. If you uh, need LDL cholesterol, and like I say, that I'm using the terminology incorrectly because everyone understands it in this wrong way. Cholesterol is in VLDL, it's in HDL, it's in IDL, it's in <laughs> it, it's, it's basically a molecule that goes around your arteries and your veins and doesn't cause any problems in your veins, doesn't cause any problems where there's low pressure in the circulatory, uh, you know, the, the vascular system, I should say. You know, it, it's, it makes no sense. The more you look at it... it, it <laughs> It, sorry, I'm a little bit exasperated, not with you, Bob, but the fact that we're still talking about something that is based on fraud and, and based on the incorrect premise from the word go. And it's just constantly being justified. And as you can see, more and more people are looking at uh, things like uh, uh, LP little a, not really understanding why we're talking about that. Um, LP little a, of course, is uh, has these cringles in, which are very like... Uh, the, the clotting factors. I don't want to lose people with the science. So there's there's a lot of things about LP little a. It's just trying to hang its hat on to the fact that it's related to LDL. So you know we can still sell you some some statins, which is another matter. Uh, I don't want to get you taken off YouTube. So I'm not going to talk about that. But uh, to me, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. And uh, my book actually goes into oxidized LDL. And misinterpretation uh, using a thing called a plaque test, PLAC, which looks at a protein and enzyme, which actually the body produces to degrade oxidized LDL. And I have proof, a case study of this actually happening where a guy was told he had a real big heart risk. And luckily he was he was um, well funded. He's got enough money to be able to do really um you know, a lot of blood tests. And what we spotted was this this plaque, this plaque test had shown that this enzyme was high and it's misinterpreted. Oh, wow, this is associated with heart risk as well. And I said to him, well, actually, that protein is known to degrade oxidized LDL. The reason it's high is not because you've got a heart issue. It's because your body is dealing with the oxidized LDL, which could come from things like seed oils, nothing to do with this diet. And lo and behold, only four months later, his flagged up oxidized LDL, which was in the red, became nice and green. So what could we conclude from that? Well, the plaque test had shown that there was this other enzyme, this other protein, degrading it. So it's 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 really getting into the weeds and understanding the bloods and what we're looking at. And then that's why I probably sound a bit exasperated, because I could go down this rabbit hole. I don't want to lose people um, by getting too technical. But there's just so much proof that the LDL, the diet heart, diet heart hypothesis is baloney. There's so much proof. Um, I can't believe we're still talking about it. I understand. I get the same questions over and over and over, and it just it's ridiculous how bad. Because they've been told cholesterol is bad for you for their entire lives, there's not much we can say to get them over that problem. But one more quick question, because I have to ask everybody I interview this question. Now, you've been in the low-carb keto carnivore space for, you said, about 10 years now. So what's it like to have not gone to the bathroom for the last 10 years, since obviously you're not eating any fiber? <laughs> This is the best it's ever been. I mean, again, fiber is one of the, I mean, I alluded to it when I talked about my mother and the bran flakes and all the roughage. I fell for that. I was always going to the toilet. I was always bloated. I had loads of gas, lots of discomfort. This way of eating, I don't smell. Um, I go to the toilet. Strangely enough, I, I'm doing a gut health analysis with a, a lab that's opened up very nearby. So I'll be able to have even more proof that this is a great way of eating. Um, bathroom trips, it, it they're not a joy. I mean, that's the word I want to use, but they're nothing. There's no problems. There's no smells. There's nothing sort of, you don't pebble dash the, the toilet. I don't want to get too gross. You know, it, it's, it's efficient. I'm not eating tons of food that my body doesn't need. So I'm not going to make lots and lots of waste. 
And also, I can't believe the fact that I don't have any gas. I mean, it's just, it's incredible because I really thought that's what humans did. Up until age 50, I thought, oh, I'm always farting. This is, you know, but this is what people do because everyone else does. Well, literally, I don't think I have emitted gas like that for, you know, at least a week. I mean, it just, it's incredible, isn't it? And fiber is a, is a huge myth. Now, again, if you look at the common sense, I won't get all sciencey and all ranty like I just did about LDL. If you look at the common sense, can you digest fiber? No. Can it can it actually do anything useful other than uh, bulk out your stool? No. And then you get this stupid argument, well, it feeds your gut bacteria. Well, we have isoproteins. We have butyrate on the blood side of the colon. We don't need short-chain fatty acids to be made by the bacteria that are feeding on the fiber. That's just all rubbish. That's what's causing the bloating. And th this is where the sort of vegan vegetarian uh, zealots just don't listen to themselves because on one hand they say well you need your fiber to make those short chain fatty acids well those are saturated fats and you're telling us that saturated fat is bad but you want us to eat something we can't digest but our bacteria make some saturated fat from it where's the sense in that if there's no joined up thinking on that side it's 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 ridiculous so um personal experience is the best thing I think, you know, everybody that I have dealt with who has removed fiber from their diet sees a big improvement in their toilet habits, much less gas, much, much less bloating and uh, gut dysbiosis or discomfort completely is eliminated. It, you certainly don't need fiber. I mean, that was just somebody's hunch. I mean, literally the first time fiber was written about, I can't remember the, uh, the researcher's name, but um yeah, she said, I've got a hunch looking at the poop of these people that fiber's good for us. That's that's what it started with. So we've got LDL starting with fraud and we've got fiber starting with a hunch. Um, ridiculous, really, in this day and age that people still believe it. Uh, certainly when their own experience or experience of people that they're meeting who are eating this way absolutely proves that it's not needed. Okay, thank you, Stephen, for being here today. Before I let you go, be sure and tell everybody where they can find all of the stuff and things about Coach Stephen. Give us your your YouTube channel, your websites, any other social media you got. Just tell us all the things of how to contact you. Okay, that's cool. Uh, well, on my name, I think, which will be displayed on the screen, you can see the UKCarnivore.com is the website. Uh, you can look up the UK Carnivore or the Carnivore Experience which is the podcast I do. I'm on YouTube. You can also look up Stephen Thomas, Bachelor of Science, you know, so you'll, you'll find me. Um, I'm on Instagram as the UK Carnivore. And I think the website is, is the best place to start, but you'll see me everywhere. Okay, everybody, get down into the comments and thank Coach Stephen for his time today because everybody's time is valuable. Don't forget, get out there, be 1% better. today tomorrow, every day. Have a great day, folks. We'll see you in the next one.